Graham, good to see you. Now you are, these days, chief investment strategist at Net Wealth. You have a host of other positions. You've been very well known in the investment world, banking and prediction world. You know, you oh, that's right. top yeah. global predictor, Bloomberg said back in 2012. You saw the nonsense of ERM 30 years ago, but you also, interestingly, put up some flashing red lights before the 2008 financial collapse, the, the collapse that very famously the Queen yeah. said, did no one see this coming? That's right. What, is, is, it, is it because of group thing? Does everybody sort of like a herd all go in the same direction? Yeah, well, 2008 was interesting. The month before that global financial crisis, mm. I was one of only two UK economists saying that there would be a deep, imminent recession. But more generally, I was head of research at Standard Chartered. And even though we were a global organisation and not very much in the West, um, our macro views suggested there was about to be a global financial crisis. Difficult to predict exactly when. So Standard Chartered emerged as the second most capitalised bank in the world. So it was possible to be taking preventative action. I think the real problem is, as you say, often groupthink. People think that good times will continue mm. and often don't think bad times will be able to hit you and you'll be able to prevent them. But the global financial crisis wasn't just a bad hit in itself. It also then led to what we've seen for the last 14 years, which has been a move to cheap money. And cheap money, which was the initial solution to the crisis and did put us back from a deep recession, unfortunately continued with low interest rates, central banks, including the Bank of England, printing money. And that's led to a whole host of problems. But avoiding groupthink is vitally yeah. important if you're an economist. Having the global as well as the domestic perspective also is crucial as well. Well, you've never been shy. Yeah. Being an independent thinker, yes, uh, you never right. you never wanted to go with a herd necessarily. It, well, it depends, yeah. Actually, that when I moved into the city, um, gosh, a long time ago, October '85, I was then with Chase, but then moved to Swiss Bank, where I was chief UK economist. And my career, shall we say, was elevating very quickly because I thought the Lawson boom was going to become a crisis. I said it was a, the boom is bound to become a bust, and most city economists thought because we were running a budget surplus. Um, yeah, it had to be good times. And I was pointing out that we had a big trade deficit and in particular private sector liabilities, namely consumer credit, was going through the roof. So it often shows that if you focus on what, for instance, if we move to now budget surpluses, that's mm. the desire. Sometimes if you look at one indicator, that can lead you into full sense of thinking. So it's not about being different to the consensus. The key thing is to try and call it as it is. And if you're part of the consensus, so be it. But if you're not part of consensus, then you need to be really sure about your thoughts oh. because you will come under lots of sticks. And your head's over the parapet. Yeah. yeah, I've done a bit of that in politics. Yes, that's right. So I know exactly what it's like. And I, I mean, you could never have imagined, I guess, when you were studying, you know, politics at university, uh, um, economics at university, that you'd finish up as chief economic advisor to a man like Boris Johnson. Yeah. How much does Boris know about economics? We know he's great at classics. How much does he know about economics? Well, um... Boris, I always thought, needed to be treated not just as a serious politician as he was, but also as a journalist. And the best way I always felt with Boris was to sit down in a scheduled meeting and to actually talk through the issues. And he's, a, as we know, a very good writer. And he would pick things up. The, one of the interesting aspects is that many people used to say he didn't do detail. And that's probably, <laughs> let's say, true. But what I found <laughs> is that when I sat down with him in a scheduled meeting, he would actually grasp the detail. So maybe it was because I always made it straightforward, simple to understand. But he did actually get to grips with some of the key economic issues. Um, at that time when I worked with him, it was uh, 2012 to 2016, mm. I, I'd basically been chief economist at Standard Chartered, very global, got more and more involved in international public policy, whether it's through World Economic Forum, Bretton Woods, etc. But then Boris approached me and at that time I was travelling five months of the year. So I, I thought, having come from London as well, and Boris, a very important character, it would be very interesting work. And in terms of coming back to your question, I yeah. thought he did grasp the issues when it came to the financial sector. That's in terms of broader economic issues, look, um, many politicians don't. I'm not saying that he grasped all the detail, but he was always keen to learn. But you obviously worked well with him. You see, when he, when he won the election, you know, when yeah. he became prime minister, when he won the election... And, you know, we had, of course, this job coming up for Governor of the Bank of England. And I thought, well, it's bound to be Lyons. He's bound to get the job because Boris knows him and respects him. And as you said, he listened to you. You know, he actually concentrated from the sounds of it. I mean, wow, you must have a gift with him. But, of course, 
you were never going to be governor of the Bank of England because you committed a terrible sin, had you not, in the eyes of the financial establishment. I mean, you backed Brexit. Isn't that what stopped you getting the job? Well, I'm not sure about that. I certainly was on top of all the issues, that's for sure. <laughs> but in terms of the... Let's take two issues here. The Bank of England, because yeah. I think um, that it is necessary to revisit... Um, the Bank of England issue, not in terms of who is governor. It's not just about personalities, it's also process and policy. I think but at you the bank... But you were excluded because you were a Brexiteer. Well, no, well, I think... No, there are lots of other issues there. I think the Bank of England has an issue with class as well. They're very also Oxbridge-focused. Uh, they also do not like... Um, Diversity so, so, of so, so you mean Irish Catholic stock didn't quite yeah. tick their well, boxes? Danny, well, it's not just me saying this. Danny Blanchfair, who is very yeah. well-respected uh, former member of the MPC, used to point this out when he was there. But I think it's about diversity of background, diversity of thought in particular. In my view, it doesn't really matter where someone comes from, but diversity of thoughts is vitally important, particularly in terms of the economy. If we take the beginning of last year, for instance, goodness, it was clear that inflation was going to pick up. It was 0.4%. The economy was about to recover as unlocking had taken place post-pandemic. It was the time to actually move away from rock-bottom interest rates. But what is remarkable, often you can't get two economists to agree, <laughs> but you had nine economists <laughs> on the MPC who thought it was appropriate to actually ease policy further. So diversity of thought is vitally important for the future. In terms of the Brexit debates, yeah, yeah. look, um, I backed um, the UK not going into the euro. In fact, the first article I wrote for the Financial Times, there I say it was back in 1997, when I point out, pointed out the history of monetary unions globally was that a monetary union of large sovereign nations could only survive if it became a political union. And ultimately, Brexit was about politics, but being outside the euro was also important economically because one size does not fit all. Greece is not the same as Germany. And as you know, we ran into all sorts of problems when we were shadowing the Deutschmark. Brexit itself is vitally important in a different respect. It's not just the politics, as you know far too mm. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, it's about the economics as well. The global economy is changing. The centre of gravity is moving from transatlantic to transpacific. And if anything, the pandemic has reinforced that. I tend to think the pandemic results in the three Gs. Grassroots, green and geopolitics. And the grassroots is moving slightly away from globalisation to more things being done closer at home. But the geopolitics is also vitally important. As we saw with the Ukrainian war starting, we've moved almost to a G3 world. Group one, America, its allies. Group two, China, its allies. Group three, the non-aligned. But superimposed on all of this is the shift to the Indo-Pacific. India in the West to America in the East. And the slowest growing region of the world economy is Western Europe. And the UK, and indeed other countries in Western Europe, needs to reposition themselves. Yeah, no, we but do. as I was saying in the referendum, though, <clears throat> it's not easy to leave something you've been in for 40 years. That's why I thought, in economic terms, the analogy I used was a Nike swoosh. We would take a hit, because it's difficult to leave. <clears throat> but it's not just leaving... It's what you do when you leave. That's key. And we've struggled a bit with that. We haven't delivered on many of the reforms that you'd like to see and I'd like to see. And yet we suddenly got Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and we, for the first time in three or four decades, got Conservative leaders who said we will reduce the size of the state, reduce the tax burden, help small businesses. Yeah. And I'm going, yay! This is fat. And I'm particularly for self-employed. I thought this war yeah. on self-employed enrages me. And I, heard, you know, I saw Gerard Lyons' name that he was, you know, advising Liz Truss and all the rest of it. But this isn't your fault. You actually warned them, didn't you? Well, I supported Penny Morden in the leadership yep. campaign. Then they got down to the final two. Uh, the Trust camp reached out to me, so I had a phone call with her about a pro-growth strategy. And then I had two meetings with her uh, before she went into Downing Street. Two meetings that she had. Now, one of them was her chief economic advisor was with her, plus Quasi Guatén and some other economists. And my view was that it couldn't just be about tax cuts. It couldn't just be about um, um, one or two of the other things that would be mentioned at the time. It was very much keep the markets on side. Um, you need to basically recognise that the markets are in a febrile state. And I did warn that, yes, explicitly, that if you did more than what was expected, <coughs> if you didn't treat the markets carefully by addressing their worries about unfunded tax cuts, mm about independence of institutions, then, yes, there will be a financial crisis. I would say, in the parallel universe, if she had just stuck to what was mentioned in the leadership campaign, 
which was the tax. corporation tax and national insurance sure, taxes right. being reversed yeah, yeah. and the energy levy, then things might have been different. Because um, I had sympathy with her argument that you can't raise taxes going into a global downturn. Yeah. But I had sympathy with Rishi Sunak's argument that you can't have unfunded tax cuts. They just cuts. did too much too soon, didn't they? Yes, it's but we are show. where we are now. And as we saw today, Rishi performed very well in Parliament. He and he basically needs to come back to it. We were saying no, he earlier, does. reposition the UK he does. in the global picture. Final thought, um, Gerard Lyons. The World Economic Forum. Yeah. Many years ago, you were on one or two of their councils. <laughs> there are many that are very worried about globalism, about central bank digital currencies. They see the World Economic Forum as being the driving force for removing nation-state democracy. Should we be worried about the WEF? Well, I'm not sh sure that we should be worried about the WEF itself, but globalisation is an important feature and we need to bear in mind that there are global forces that um, work on the positive but also maybe sometimes on the negative. The thing about the World Economic Forum, I, as you said, I spoke at many of their debates, yeah. that post the, the global financial crisis, I was asked to represent the financial sector in the big debate against so, Barney Frank from the US Congress, <laughs> Pascal Lamy and others. So they do provide a forum where okay. you can debate so you issues. Could so so, you, so you, you could fight against people that you would disagree with? Well, yeah. The, yeah, but the, their motto <coughs> is committed to ensuring that we improve the state of the world. I often used to say that the motto should be changed to committed in, to ensuring that nothing ever changes. And that's the aspect. So they are very conformist. What we need to make sure we do here in the UK yeah. is post-Brexit, have a good relationship with the EU. We need to address our domestic agenda. And coming back to your question about World Economic Forum, is making sure that on the global agenda, we're not only positioning ourselves globally, but we're influencing the global debate, which we can do, given that the UK is the world's fifth, sixth biggest economy. We're still on Super. the... Superb. So I don't think we should be diverted by being worried about the World okay. Economic Forum. It's, it, it's there. It, it's a great don't, explanation. Yeah. Could talk to you for hours, Gerard Lance. Cheers, Thank take you. care.